you everything you needed to know about salvation, this little book would be it. In 1 Peter, there's everything you need to know about salvation, about God, and about His Son, and how to be saved, and how to live as a saved person in Christ. Did you know that? Amen. Tiny book, not, a, not many pages, not many chapters, but there's a lot of information. Good information in it. Now let me ask you, what was Peter's profession? So what kind of education do you think Peter had? Very little. <laughs> One of the greatest things about the New Testament is to look at Peter's life from the vantage point of the Gospels, see how he matured from first meeting Jesus, then following Jesus for uh, over three years, and then Jesus goes back into heaven. And what happens to Peter? Peter becomes the leader of the group and the church, right? How do you take this man who was a fisherman, very rough around the edges, with very little education, and turn him into the powerhouse that you find in the book of Acts, and turn him into this seasoned pastor that you find here in 1 Peter? Now, this was the same man that on the night Jesus was betrayed, what did Peter do? Now, listen, do you think Peter would like to forget that chapter of his life? Actually, it made who he was. Do you know that Peter actually had that written down in these Gospels so that it would follow him all the days of his life? But as Ricky said, it's very important. That chapter in his life was the turning point and it made him who he was as a preacher for God. Amen. That denial is what finally got Peter's heart broken to the point where he would fully submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What happened when Jesus asked Peter, well he asked all the disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? What was Peter's response? Okay, now, now, he asked, well, hold on, let me phrase this correctly. He asked them, who do men say that I am? And what were some of the answers from the disciples? Now, this wasn't Peter. Okay, but he wasn't asking what they thought. He was saying, what do these people that are around us all the time, who do they say that I am? And they told him, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Jeremiah, or you're one of the prophets. Right? And then Jesus didn't go into a big explanation of who he was. What was his next question? Who do you say that I am? And Peter was the first one with a response. What did he say? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? Peter believed. Peter loved Jesus. But Peter wasn't fully converted. The Bible tells you that that was the first time that the disciples actually said who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and that's the first time Jesus accepted that. But after that time, do you realize that as soon as Peter said that, that Jesus started telling them what it meant to be the Messiah, that he was going to Jerusalem, and that he would fall into the hands of of the chief priests, and they would put him to death, and on the third day he would rise again. What was Peter's response to that? Surely not. Never happened to you, Lord. And what was Jesus' response to that? Yeah. So do you see this man, Peter? He was a walking contradiction. And this was in the very presence of Jesus. But do you realize that it was after Jesus left that Peter became converted, the great apostle? What do you think the difference was? Holy Spirit? There you go. He forgot about self. Jesus said that it is for your benefit that I leave. Because if I leave, then I will send you another comforter. So who do you think has the most advantage? 
Peter, James, John, the people that lived when Jesus was walking the earth, or those who came after? Yeah. Say it loud, don't be afraid. That's That's the the Jesus said, it is better for you if I go. Because if I go, then I will send you another comforter. There is no excuse today about not knowing Jesus, about what he requires, about what it means to give your life fully to him. And there's no excuse for not having a relationship with him that is better than any relationship you've ever experienced. Because Jesus promises you that if you call on him, he will hear. And if you accept him, he will give you the Holy Spirit. God will live inside of you. And so you have this man, Peter, going from the fisherman to the great leader of the church. And he writes this small epistle of 1 Peter. And in this epistle, as I told you, contains everything you would need to know to be saved. 1 Peter chapter 1, let's look at that. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the... Strangers, okay, or pilgrims, right? Scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What is that telling you? Something happened. There's a word for it. The New King James uses the word diaspora or dispersion. What does dispersion mean? Scattered. Hence, that's what this word here means, scattered, okay? So Peter is writing this letter to believers who have been scattered all around the territories of that region. They're not centrally located in Jerusalem, right? But they have been scattered. But they have heard the message of Jesus Christ, and they have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Now, do you think it was easy for these brethren to live in these places and follow Jesus Christ? I want you to understand this is why Peter wrote his epistle. Because the brethren were suffering persecution. And Peter was going to write to them. Bob, maybe it's another storm coming. <laughs> Peter was writing to them to build them up, to explain to them that when you accept Jesus Christ, there's a cross that comes with it. The cross isn't something that's comfortable, but the cross is something that's painful. Is that right? So as a Christian, suffering is a part of your life. You have to realize that. And the hardest thing to realize is that it's part of God's will and plan. And Peter never backs away from this. Do you guys understand this? When you read 1 Peter, he puts it right out there. Paul does the same thing, never backs off on the suffering part. He tells Timothy to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. What is a soldier's responsibility? To follow the orders of the leader. Right? And so he tells Timothy, I know it's hard, but you have to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. And there's no difference between Timothy and you and I today. In this life, there are times that are hard. And there are times that are very hard. Okay? But God calls you to obedience. But the obedience isn't expected to come from you. It's expected to come from your relationship with Him. And the Holy Spirit living inside you gives you the power to be faithful. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Let me read this to you. Persecution can cause either one of two things. It can either cause growth or it can cause bitterness in the Christian life. Response determines the result. In writing to Jewish believers struggling in the midst of persecution, Peter encourages them to conduct themselves courageously for the person and program of Jesus Christ. Both their character and conduct must be above reproach. 
having been born again to a living hope, they are to imitate the Holy One who has called them. The fruit of that character will be conduct rooted in submission. Citizens submissive to their government, servants submissive to their masters, wives submissive to their husbands, husbands submissive to their wives, and Christians submissive to one another. Only after submission is fully understood does Peter deal with the difficult area of suffering. You guys understand this? This is a very foundational point of your Christian walk. You will never understand suffering or why you have to deal with this pain until you understand submission. What does the word submission mean? To submit to something or someone? What does it mean? Say it loud, I can't hear you. Give yourself over. To give yourself over. Does it mean you're in control? No. It means you submit. Now you understand, Paul never says, don't pay your taxes because your government is evil. Paul says, submit to the governing authorities because they are set up, whether you like it or not, by who? God. By God Himself. Amen. Whether you like the government or whether you don't like the government, God has called you to submit to that government. Amen. God has called you to submit to the governing authorities, whether it's at your school, whether it's in your home, whether it's on your job. God has called you to be submissive. God has also called you to submit within the family of God. That as Christians we are to submit to one another. Amen. And is there a place for pride within the submissive heart? And this is why last week I told you, this is why the Holy Spirit does not work with the power that He wants to within your church. Because we do not submit to one another. And when we get to that point where we trust each other enough to submit to one another, then the Holy Spirit can be poured out in such a way that you will see revival that the people that live around the church will wonder what's going on there and how can I become a part of that. Okay? So, Peter is writing to all of these believers scattered throughout this region of Asia. And he tells them something very important. He explains to them who they are. And the word that he uses is this word here in verse 2. It's called what? Elect. What does the word elect mean? Chosen. chosen, right? Do you realize you were chosen by God? Not you chose God, but you were chosen by God. Here's another word, preordained. That you are not the one choosing God, but it was God choosing you. And that God had this plan in place through the eons of eternity past, that when your time came, He knew your face, He knew your character, and He had an inheritance set aside with your name on it. Now, in this life, how many of you would like to wake up tomorrow? You get mail on Saturday, right? It's okay, you can answer that question. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not here to judge. Okay, you get mail on Saturday, right? Now, wouldn't you like to open that mail after dark and find a letter in there saying you just inherited $30 million? Right? And all you got to do is come down to this lawyer's office, sign these papers, and that money is in the bank, and it is yours. Now, wouldn't you like that? Would it make your life a lot easier? Yes. Think about it. Okay? So, in this life, that's our dream. Isn't that what the lottery promises? Right? Isn't that why people will spend all their money on lottery tickets? Okay? Because if they could win, then all their troubles would be over with. And so we put our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations. I remember when my son was younger, and I asked him, you know, how do you plan on, you know, supporting yourself when you get older? He was probably 14 at the time. 
This is a 14-year-old boy's mind. He goes, I'm going to get a girlfriend who has a rich dad, and he's going to help me in his business, give me a job, and I will not take care of anything else. We laugh at that because we're adults. He truly believed that that's what was going to happen. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> that's why as adults we can laugh at that because we see just the, the futility of that. <coughs> then, then he said, well, I'm going to be a basketball player. It's like, son, you're not even six foot tall. <laughs> and I've seen you jump, buddy, and I just don't think that's going to happen. So we will put our hopes and our dreams and our future on this earth in those things and we totally forget that in God's eyes we are elect. And that, you skip down to verse 4, God has, what's the biggest vault that you can think of here in this country? Fort Knox, very good. What's in Fort Knox? <coughs> Gold, right? Probably nothing. You know what I'm saying? With, with the way the government is, there's probably nothing in there about a bunch of pieces of paper saying, I owe you. Okay? So, but Fort Knox, think about that. Think of the security. Think of what can be put in there. But do you realize that God has a vault in heaven? that is so much bigger than Fort Knox and contains so much more treasure. And do you realize that you have, a, what's that word? Inheritance. An inheritance. And what's the next word after that? <laughs> Meaning that his government won't take that money and put an IOU in there. So that when you get there, it's like, well, I'm sorry we spent that. But I'll pay it back some way. God has given you an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that what? Fades not away. Why do you think Jesus said, lay your treasures up in heaven, not here on this earth? Do not put all of your hopes and all your aspirations and all your dreams here in this life. Realize that this life is fleeting and that the riches you have today can be gone that quick tomorrow. Or you better, most of the time you just never get them in the first place. How many of you here are rich? Raise your hand. I look around. I'm talking money-wise. The world, the way the world looks, how many here this morning are rich? Raise your hand. I don't see any hands on us. <laughs> well, she's rich because you pay everything for her. So she can raise her hand. She's good. So listen. Let's say that you were Bill Gates. He could raise, if he was here this morning, he could raise his hand if I asked that question. Is that right? Yeah, because he's definitely rich. In the eyes of the world, he is beyond rich. Okay, but it doesn't matter how rich he is because within 50 years of his age, he's probably going to be dead. Right? That is an inheritance and a richness that is defiled and corruptible. That's all this world can give you. Okay? So if you spend all your time and all your energy and all your life gathering riches, at some point you're going to die and somebody else is going to have it. Now how many of you know somebody who has inherited a lot of money? Raise your hand. Okay. Now I know quite a few people that have never worked because they inherited money and they are not happy people. Nor are they productive people. Okay. Um, most of the ones that I know that inherited any type of money either spent it, drug themselves out, or wasted it one way or another. So, and then you can look in history and look at the great wealth of this world and what happens to it after those people die and their family gets a hold of it. Okay? And you realize that that kind of money and inheritance does not guarantee happiness. Okay? But what God gives you, and the inheritance He gives you, He uses these words on purpose. It is incorruptible, and it is undefiled, and it will bring you true happiness. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither thief steals, 
Rust corrupts. Moth eats. Okay? I'm kind of wondering, what did they have back then that was worth so much money that a moth could eat? Maybe silk. You know what I'm saying? Paper money today, I guess. But what God promises you is an inheritance that will last you throughout eternity. Now, how many here are on Social Security? Raise your hand. All right, here we go. Now we're getting, now we're getting some replies. <laughs> how many of you, I think I asked this last week, are worried that your retirement money will run out before your life does? Okay, see, so there's people raising their hands, and I'm right in here. Because I have no, well, I got some retirement money, but I'll probably work till I die. <laughs> Do you understand that this is what this life offers you? You can plan, you can not plan. But at some point, you're going to get to the age where you just can't work no more. Because you're too old. And then, you still have to live. So in this life, either you're going to have something, or you're going to have nothing. What God promises you is that His inheritance for you will never run out will never out, or you will never outlive it, that for as long as you're around, your inheritance will be around and it will always be refilled. No matter how much you spend, it will be put back. You can never outspend what God has put aside for you. Now here's the thing I want you to understand, is that you're elect. You're elect according to the foreknowledge of God. What does that word foreknowledge mean? Another word for that is predestination. Okay? So, here's something that will give you a headache if you think about it too hard. You're elect, right? And you've been elect because of the foreknowledge of God. So that even before you were born, you were elect. But yet you have freedom of choice. And it is your choice that allows you to be elect. But yet God has already elected you. But yet your choice can either make you elect or keep you from election. <coughs> now think about that. And tell me you won't need an answer. This is why within the church today, within the Christianity, all the churches, there is division between what predestination means. Uh, why there are some that believe that once you're saved, you're always saved no matter what you do because you've been elected by the foreknowledge of God, and there's nothing you can do, and you're powerless to influence that decision. The problem with that is, is what about free choice? This whole issue, this whole great controversy, boils down to free choice. Did God create Lucifer? No. Did God create Lucifer to become the devil? No. no. Did God create Lucifer to sin? When God created Lucifer, was there any darkness or imperfection in him? No. So, how did sin get inside Lucifer? It's a mystery of anything. There's a mystery. There's no explanation for it. If it can be explained, then it can be justified. And there can be a reason for it. There is no reason for sin. But what it comes down to is choice, right? If God made him perfect in all of his ways, then at some point he had to choose the opposite of what God intended for him. Is that right? Here's a question for you. What was it that caused Lucifer to rebel? Jealousy. Jealousy? Pride. 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 Do you realize what caused the pride and the jealousy was, was discontentment? Right? He was discontented with who and what he was. Now I've told you this a while back ago. And we understand this from the devil's perspective because this is our lives. We understand discontentment. But do you realize that when God made all the angels, if he made you to be a cupbearer, that's what you're going to be for all eternity. And you would never raise to anything higher, and you would never get demoted to anything lower. You gotta understand that, right? That if you were the uh, angelic choir host, that's what you were for all eternity. 
no room for advancement. Right? But there was no reason for advancement. Amen. God created them for a specific purpose because that's what their purpose for being created Amen. was. There was no such thing as discontentment <clears throat> or disharmony. This is the mystery of iniquity. Lucifer looked at Christ and wanted to be him. He was discontented with who he was. Now, how do you get an entire race of perfect beings? How do you get a third of them to fall? You bring discontentment to them. How does the television commercials get you to buy their product? They make it sound good. They entice you or they make you discontented with what you have. Right? We know discontentment. That is a part of the fallen human nature. And it works in selling you everything. It also works in ambition, right? And pride. Yes, Matt? Is that related to covetous, covetousness? Yeah, it, fall, it can fall right in there. Discontentment and covetousness goes hand in hand together, right? Now, let me ask you a question. We talked about Paul a little earlier, and I'm going to ask you a question about Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. Is that right? Before, before he became Paul, his name was Saul. And Saul was, as he said in his own words, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Do you realize that the Pharisees were rich? It wasn't a poor Pharisee. Okay? It was like a country club. Okay? And Paul was one of them. And so when Paul had this conversion to Jesus Christ, Paul gave up everything. Paul was educated in the greatest schools of Jerusalem. He sat under the greatest teacher in Jerusalem. He tells you that in his own words. But he also tells you that he learned to be content in all things, in plenty and in want. That was Paul's secret. He learned to be content. Isn't that what drives us? Isn't that what just keeps nagging at us and nagging at us? This discontentment. I'm not happy with my life, I'm not happy with my spouse, I'm not happy with my job, I'm not happy with my car, I'm not happy with my bank account, I can go on and on and on. Isn't that our life? That's not what it should be for Christians. The Christian life is, I am happy with Jesus Christ, and what I have right now is enough. That's hard. That's hard for this fallen flesh. But that is what true conversion is. That's where it brings you. Now, understand this. Make sure that we're clear. It doesn't mean that you don't strive for better things, right? How many of you like electricity? <laughs> How many of you like uh, a toilet that you press the little handle and it flows? <laughs> now, do you think that just happened? Do you think Edison, when he was dealing with the light bulb, got it right the first time? <clears throat> So see, now I'm not talking about laziness, I'm not talking about worthlessness, what I'm talking about is the <clears throat> dangers of pride and ambition and the discontentment that that brings, okay? Now, if Edison was content with the first level